Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Last time I did speak a little bit about lead vector. I will quickly repeat first the lead vector because it forms a nice, nice entity with the following uh, topics. So lead vector was uh, defined by Hermann Carolus Burger in 1946. Preconditions for lead vector concept are dipole in a fixed location and conductor may be whichever because it is finite or infinite inhomogeneous. So it may be homogeneous, inhomogeneous, finite, infinite, whichever. Only thing which is uh, things which are assumed are, which I said earlier, that the conductor must be linear and isotropic. Lead vec vector concept is based on two very simple fundamental principles, linearity, which is Ohm's law, and superposition, defined by our good friend Hermann Ludwig Ferdinand von Helmholtz. And I mentioned that Ohm's law was defined already by Henry Cavendish. I did show you this very simple example about Ohm's law. I go it quickly through again. Assume there is current source, these two resistors. If the current source magnitude is one ampere, this is just assumption, and we measure here a voltage of 0 0.02 volts. Then, because of linearity, if the current source is five times stronger, five amperes, then the voltage there is five times higher, 0 0.1 volts. This is the linearity, the Ohm's law. Now we may write this in uh, this relationship in a general form, u equals to c times j, where c is 0 0.02 volts per ampere, which is ohms. Very basic, fundamental, simple issue. So, what is lead vector? It is the ohms law which I did show you, in three dimensions. In the previous slide, the Ohm's law was shown as you usually consider it in one dimension or dimensionless. Lead vector is Ohm's law in three dimensions. And why in three dimensions? Therefore, that we have volume conductors and volume sources, which are three-dimensional. Linearity. Each three components of the lead vector tell what potential is generated to the measurement point due to each three components of the source dipole. Linearity. And superposition. The total potential in the measurement point is the sum of the potentials due to all the three source components. Very simple. I did show you this, this slide as well. I go more quickly through again. Assume we have a volume conductor. That is how I usually draw a volume conductor, like a kind of potato here. There is a source point and there is a measurement point on the surface. Not necessarily on the surface, but let's just make it practical and think that it is on the surface. Let us place here a unit current source to the source location in the direction of x-axis, so it is i. Let us measure what kind of potential it generates here, and we find, we do not calculate anything, we just measure and find that the potential here is c sub x. Due to linearity, just as I said in the previous slide, if the source here is Px times i, 
Then, of course, the potential here is Px times Cx because of linearity. Very simple. We repeat this on y direction and we repeat this in z direction. The linearity holds, of course, in each of these cases. Because of linearity, in each case, phi is linearly proportional to the dipole magnitude. This is the linearity. Superposition. Let us place to the source point an arbitrary dipole, P. Arbitrary, whichever. We just place that kind of dipole. That dipole is composed of three components, X, Y, and Z components, which are PXI, PYJ, and PZK. So the dipole in uh, vector algebraic form can be written that it is PXI plus PYJ plus PZK. This dipole generates here a potential phi, which is given here. The first x component generates this potential, y component this potential, and z component that potential. Due to superposition, the total potential is sum of those component potentials. Very simple. Don't ever think that it would be difficult. It is fundamentally, basically primitive. Let us now define a vector, C, which is Cxi plus Cyj plus Czk. So these components are just those. Then we may write that potential phi is C dot P, C dot P, because this dot product in vector algebra is this one. This, from vector algebra again, you know that C dot P is found so that we take the projection of source vector P to this uh, uh, lead vector C. The projection is here and we multiply it with the magnitude of the C. So phi is C dot P is m absolute value of, of magnitude of C times magnitude of P times cosine alpha. This is just how it is geometrically made. Because of superposition, phi is proportional to the sum of the potentials of each dipole component. And this proportional coefficient is three-dimensional and it is the lead vector C. So this is the lead vector. Lead vector is a three-dimensional proportionality coefficient which tells what kind of potential is generated to the measurement point due to the source dipole in the source point. It is three-dimensional. The, the trick is the trick is that it is Ohm's law, but it is in three dimensions. That is the trick. That was what I told you last time. I start new issues now. Actually, what is the bioelectric potential? What do we do? Bio, sorry, bioelectric problem. What we solve. The problem is not that we measure the potential somewhere. And it is arbitrary reference point somewhere which I intentionally omitted. The bioelectric potential is that we measure the potential difference, which is the voltage between two points. That is the problem, of course. So we have the volume conductor here. We have the source inside. And we find somehow, which I tell you quickly, potentials here and potential here. And we are interested in the potential different difference, the voltage, which is phi 1 minus phi 2. This is the measurement situation, of course. Let us first find the potential phi 1. For that, we need to find the lead vector C1. How do we find the lead vector C1? Can anyone tell? 
I just told it to you. We place consecutively here unit current sources in x, y, and z direction and find what is the potential there. And that gives the lead vector C1. Now the potential phi1 may be calculated. It is C1 dot P. That is the potential here. We do the same here. We find first the lead vector corresponding measurement point phi2. How do we do it? We do it so that we place here consecutively unit current sources in direction x, y, and z and find the potential what they generate here. And that is the lead vector C2. Now, with these lead vectors C1 and C2, we find what is the voltage between these two points. And how do we do it? Look down here. Here is, sorry, it is just, uh, cannot see very clearly, but V12, this V12, is phi1 minus phi2, potential 1, potential minus potential 2, which is C1 dot P, that is the potential uh, phi1, minus C2 dot P, which is the potential phi2, and you find that it is C1 minus C2 dot P, and we just find out how does this vector C1 minus C2 look like, and we do geometrically this subtraction. Here is vector C1, here is vector C2, just taken from there. And this vector is C1 minus C2. Now we have found lead vector C12, which tells us what kind of potential difference is generated between those two measurement points due to arbitrary source dipole in the source point. And when we have this vector, vector C12, we do just the dot product of P source vector and lead vector, which is found geometrically like that. That is the voltage. So you find that in the first previous slide and here, I intentionally did not mention what is the reference point for the potential when we measure the potential. Of course, we should have a reference point where we refer it. I just forgot it intentionally because now you see that when we do the measurement of potential differences, it is of course cancelled because the reference is in both of these potentials, it is cancelled. So the reference point is intentionally omitted. So what have I shown to you? I have shown that we have to first, to, to find out what is the voltage between two measurement points due to arbitrary source in the source point. We have to find the lead vector which corresponds these two measurement points. And we, in principle, we find it by first finding the lead vector for the first point and then lead vector for the second point and make the subtraction and that is the lead vector. So this is the first time when I do geometrically these calculations. It may take a little bit time from your brain, brains to, to, to uh, switch them to geometrical calculation on Ohm's law, which you have used to do just uh, arithmetically. But we need this geometrical way of discussing because our volume conductor is three-dimensional and our source is three-dimensional. That is the trick. Do you remember this slide which I did show you on the first lecture? Let's go back here. We have volume conductor 
we have a lead, which means that we have placed two uh, electrodes here and joined them with the, with the wires. And we want to find out potential difference, which is voltage here, due to some source somewhere in a certain location here. To do that, we find what is the corresponding lead vector. How do we find it? We find it simply so that we place to this location, we do the calibration, we place to this location first a unit current source in x direction. You have heard this again, heard this earlier, I say it again. And we find out what is the voltage here. It is so much. We place to the same location a unit current source in y direction and measure what is the voltage. It is so much. And the same in z direction. Now these three component vectors are components of the sensitivity vector or the lead vector. So the lead vector is this one, its components are those. This is the lead vector, which is a three-dimensional proportionality coefficient, which tells what kind of voltage is generated here due to arbitrary source in the source location. So let us place this lead vector there. It is now there. Now when we have any arbitrary source here, we just do the dot product. Lead vector dot source vector and that is the voltage here. This is what I did show you on the first lecture. This is just calibration linearity in three dimensions. Let's go on. There was a gentleman, Willem Eindhoven, who is the father of clinical electrocardiography, who received a Nobel Prize in 1924 from his uh, achievements. And uh, one of his achievements was just a definition of Eindhoven triangle. I give this, I return back to electrocardiography in great details later on, but I just show you now Eindhoven triangle, because this is a nice application of lead vector. Preconditions. Two-dimensional dipole. The source is not three-dimensional. Eindhoven made everything in one plane, in the frontal plane, so the source in this case is two-dimensional. Conductor is infinite homogeneous volume conductor, because Eindhoven did not consider at all the effect of inhomogeneities and boundaries. Equal solution is obtained with a homogeneous sphere where the dipole is it in its center. These are both trivial solutions. So let us do like Eithoven made. He did model the patient or the person the volume conductor of the person with a homogeneous sphere like this. Here is the source dipole, the heart. And the measurement points are two hands, right and left hand and left leg. What is the potential here due to the source dipole P? The lead vector, describing what is the potential here, the CR, is the line or the vector which is connecting the source point, the center of the sphere, and this measurement point. And now comes a very important issue. Please, please remember and understand that it is this line only on this, in this case where the measurements are made on the surface of this sphere, homogeneous sphere. In general case it is not. If it were, the word would be, a word would be very simple, but it is not. In this special case it is this vector 
starting from there, going to the measurement point. Phi L, phi L, similarly, we have the C lead vector C L, and phi F, we have the lead vector C sub F. But we are not interested, or we actually are not able to measure the potentials, those if we do not have the reference point. So let's go further on. What we are interested, we are interested in the voltages between these two measurement points. And of course, the V1 is phi L minus phi R, which is c1 dot p, we form this kind of lead vector c1, which is a difference of cl and cr, just as I did show you before. Similarly, v2, this voltage, is found as a difference of these two potentials, and for that we form a difference vector c sub uh, 2, which is difference of these two lead vector CF and CR. And same for the third uh, lead. These three lead vectors form an equilateral triangle and that is called Eindhoven triangle. Is it equilateral in, in real case? No, far from that. Why Eindhoven then draw it as an equilateral triangle. I have the publications on, on his uh, correspondence with his colleagues and he said that it is equilateral because that is the most beautiful triangle. There's no scientific uh, background here. It is beautiful. Well, science is beautiful. That's nice. I don't blame very much Eindhoven, only a little bit. Because Eindhoven did live at the time when this kind of science was just in the beginning. He made a lot of important contributions. But he was surprisingly much uh, stuck to this equilateral triangle. And you will see uh, in later lectures how dominating this equilateral triangle really was for a long period of time in electrocardiology. So how the triangle <coughs> looks in real, real case, really. It has been measured how it looks like, and I show you. So Eindhoven assumed that these three lead vectors formed an equilateral triangle. Frank, to which I come very soon, Ernest Frank, constructed a finite homogeneous model for the human thorax which means that it was a tank which had the form of the male thorax and it was filled by saline so that it was homogeneous inside, it had the form of the body. And he measured the triangle which is now called Frank Triangle and he got this kind of form. Burger made a model which was finite inhomogeneous. Actually he made it quite much earlier and he measured the triangle and he got this kind of result. This is true, but this is very misleading. You may consider that yes, apparently Eindhoven triangle is wrong, but surprisingly, because Burger and Frank triangle are so similar, you may conclude that it is the outer surface, the outer boundary, which has the dominating effect to the measurements and the inside inhomogeneities don't have practically any effect. That is not the case. It just happens to be, for the reason which I show you, it is just a question of chance. This is the finite homogeneous model of uh, Ernst Frank. And uh, uh, I come in more detail to this quite soon. It was made for plastic, it's a male thorax, and uh, he, he had a coordinate system. Uh, he divided this uh, or defined the 12 levels. Level 6 was going through the center of the heart. Distance between the levels was actually 2 inches, which is 
about five centimeters. And on each level, he defined the coordinate system where these kind of lines, coordinate lines went through the center of the, uh, of the thorax in 22.5 in degrees uh, uh, angle and points where they did cross the outer surface were named from A to B. The center of the heart was two, four centimeters front to this center plane and one inch, 2.5 centimeters to the left. Actually, Frank had his model upside down and two times larger, therefore that he could do the measurements more accurately. And it was easier to handle the dipoles inside the models because it was open from here. So that's how it practically did look, but it, that's a practical issue. Uh, this is uh, the finite inhomogeneous model, which was made by Burger and Van Milan in 1945. This has a historical interest. I, I only show this for historical reasons. You find that the human body is modeled with a cavity which is uh, between these two halves. The, it is placed together and filled by saline. Uh, there are left and right hand electrodes are here, left and right, and here is the foot electrode. The source dipole, the heart, is here, three-dimensional dipole. And the inhomogeneities are modeled in two cases. Firstly, there is a spine, it is made from cork, and that is fully insulating. And then he made uh, uh, from a cotton two sacks in the form of the lungs and filled them with sand. And then he got the resistivity, which is four times higher. So that using that kind of uh, uh, sacks was uh, was uh, the only way to do to do modeling at that time because computers did not exist. So uh, there were two sacks made from cotton fabric and filled by sand. Both of those full of sand and. Uh, the resistivity in that region was four times higher because, firstly, these sand uh, species of sand pieces of stone which form the sand have uh, uh, infinite uh, resistivity practically, and they uh, uh, replaced the, the saline. And secondly, the electric current had to go along a longer path in that region. So therefore actually using by double sand, it was possible to get four times higher resistivity. What means double sand, having sand which has uh, large, large pieces of stone and then small pieces, fine sand, which goes to those regions. So that is the maximum, four times higher resistivity. That is a historical way. Believe or not, believe or not, when I made my doctoral thesis on magnetocardiography at Stanford University between 74 and 76, 1974-76, I used sand to produce inhomogeneities in the model. So I maybe I'm, I'm the last, last scientist in the world who has used sand in modeling inhomogeneities of the uh, electron and magnetocardiography. Computers didn't exist for that purpose then. Okay, that's his story. Okay, this is uh, uh, from the doctoral thesis of Jari Hyttinen in, in my institute in Tampere. He made a computer modeling. So that was a transition. I used sand, but my student used computer modeling. Uh, he made a model of the human body. He used two kind of models finite homogeneous, which is the Frank case, and he got the Frank triangle for the Frank triangle. He got this kind of forms in different locations in the heart regions. Now this, these are the three projections. So you find that uh, if the source point, source is location 
is, is there and there and there, the corresponding frank triangle has different geometric forms. It depends on the location. Here is from his uh, thesis, the variation of the Burger Triangle, finite, inhomogeneous volume conductor, and now you see how they are, of course, similarly changing the Burger Triangle as a function of the source location. The reason why the Burger Triangle and Frank Triangle in my previous slide were so similar is that they were measured in principle in such locations in the models where they have quite the same form. But as I said, it is misleading to believe that the inhomogeneities would not have a major role. I go to the next method. It is the image surface. It was defined by Hermann Carolus Burger, again, preconditions are dipole in the fixed location is the source and conductor is finite, infinite, inhomogeneous. So actually the preconditions are exactly the same as for the lead vector. <coughs> the image surface describes the lead vectors for all measurement points on the volume conductor surface. With the lead vector concept, you recognize that I did find the lead vectors only for two points or so. In image surface, the lead vectors are found for all measurement points, all points on the surface of the volume conductor. This information makes it possible to find such measurement points whose lead vectors have the desired properties. When we know the behavior of the lead vector everywhere on the volume conductor surface, we are able to find such points where the lead vector has the desired direction and magnitude. That's the trick. Just straightforward extension of the lead vector concept. Let's have a volume conductor here. There's a source point. I do everything now in two dimensions because the, uh, the, the screen is two dimensional, but of course this is a three dimensional problem. I forget the third direction. We find the lead vector for a certain measurement point on the surface. How do we find it? Is there anyone who knows? I possibly said it quite many times. We place here a unit current source in direction J and measure what is the voltage there and place it on the coordinate axis Y. Then we place here a unit current source in the direction of Z, measure the voltage, we get the Z component of the lead vector and they form the lead vector C for this point. Then we draw this lead vector here on the, in the space. We continue this process for all measurement points now in two dimensions, find all the lead vectors, corresponding lead vectors, and join these tips of the lead vectors. And it forms, of course, in three dimension, it forms a surface, which is called image surface. Now this is in the image space, the image surface. I ask you where in the image space would locate a point which is inside the volume conductor. Where would it locate here in the image space? Is a lead vector for this point here, is it longer or shorter than the lead vector for the surface point? There are two possibilities. 50% chance that you answer correct. 
How is the potential due to the source? How is the potential here inside? Is it higher or lower than on the surface? Well, because we are closer to the source, of course the potential is here higher. And because it is higher, the corresponding lead vector is of course longer, so the points inside the volume conductor reflect in the image space outside the image surface. That's why I intentionally did draw the shading here outside the surface because the body is here and here is just empty space. So it is kind of inverse imaging. It is like placing one kilogram of dynamite to the heart and exploding it. Then, then it becomes an, an inverse, inverse imaging of the case. That would be a nice experiment for your la lab works. <laughs> Let's do it the other way around. Where do you locate the points inside the image surf surface in the real space? This is a bit complicated. Uh, don't be frustrated. Actually, it is very simple. You find it in the few next slides how simple it is. But how do we find it? How do we find in real space the corresponding point for this point in the image space? We draw an arbitrary line which goes through this point. It intersects the image surface in points P1 prime and P2 prime. And from the construction of the image space, we know that the corresponding points in the real space are P1 and P2 they are, whichever they are here, like that. Then we measure the relative magnitudes of A and B, and we place here two resistors whose ratio is R sub A and R sub B. That point P is locating there. Why it comes so? You, it is not difficult. You find it, you see it quite soon in the a few next slides. Uh, the, re the equations used to find the, the relation of the potentials are given here. You find them from the book as well. That is not difficult. I have taught you a new method, image surface. Why? Why in the world I have been speaking about image surface? Does it have any application? Of course, it has several applications. I take the most obvious application, which is design of orthonormal lead systems. What is an orthonormal lead system? Orthonormal lead system is a lead system or measurement system which has two properties. It measures the orthogonal components of the source, the x, y, and z component, which are orthogonal. And secondly, uh, th that is an orthogonal system. Secondly, it is normalized. It measures all these three components with the same sensitivity. So it is normalized. So we want to design an orthonormal lead system for detecting the electric heart vector or the heart vector, making vector cardiography and so on. How do we utilize image surface concept in this? The story is the following. We have the volume conductor, the human body, for, and we have its source location here. Everything is changing if you change the source location. For this source location, for this volume conductor, we find the image surface in the way which I told you several, several times. We first find how to measure the Y component of the source. Y component in this coordinate system, it is this uh, horizontal component pointing to the right. 
if we want to measure the y component of the source, what kind of lead vector our lead must be? So we have a lead and there is associated a lead vector to the lead. What properties the lead vector must have to measure only the y component? This is simple. What is the voltage? It is C dot P. Our P is now PY. Our lead vector is C. When is the lead measuring the Y component? Of course, then when the lead vector is in the direction of the Y component. Then it is measuring because it is C dot P. When it is, if it is in the direction of Y component, it measures only the Y component. So we find from the image, with the image space, measurement points where, the me when measurement is made between those points, the lead vector is in Y direction. So it is in the image space, it is in the horizontal direction, in the Y direction. We have infinite number of possibilities. We can just find that, let's find those points where we can make the measurement. We have infinite number of possibilities where the lead vector is in the direction of Y component coordinate. We select one of those. Which do we select? We select those points where the measurement signal is strongest, which means that the lead vector is longest. Why do we do S therefore that uh, we get uh, best signal quality and uh, smallest noise? So we select those. And the lead vector corresponding these points P1 prime and P2 prime is this. And from the construction of image space, we know that these points are in the real space, those. Now, with this procedure, we know that when we make the measurement between points P1 and P2, we get a signal which is uh, measuring only the Y component of the source and has the best sensitivity. Because that lead vector is in the direction of the Y axis and because it is the longest possible. We have found how to measure the Y component. Then we find how to measure the Z component. The lead, I repeat, the lead, lead vector of the lead, which measures the Z component of the source, of course, must be in the direction of Z axis. Then it is measuring only the Z component. And to get the best signal quality, we select those measurement points where the lead vector is longest, to get the st strongest signal. So we have the infinite number of possibilities here, we find what they are. There it is longest. So we select those measurement points and we find that the uh, measurement points in real space are those. When we do measurement from there, we get a signal which is proportional only to the Z component of the source. We have now designed an orthogonal lead system. But we have to normalize it because we find that actually the lead vector for Y component and lead vector for Z component here on the left side are not of equal length. You find that the lead vector for Z component is so much longer. Now we attenuate decrease the signal amplitude by using this kind of resistor, resistors whose resistances, ratio of the resistances is ratio of the lengths of this part and that part. So we get the signal there. We could also find in the image space a lead vector which is directly of the same length. But it is better to do like this because we get the larger signal. 
less noise and with this resistor network network we normalize it. Now we have designed an orthonormal lead system to detect uh, Y and Z components of the source and the X component is designed e equally in the X direction. I go now to the image surface of the homogeneous male thorax of Ernest Frank. I did tell you already before how the coordinates are and so on. Ernest Frank used this model to find out how the image surface for this model looks like. How did he find the image surface? Does anyone know? Have you ever heard how to do that? It is done so that he placed consecutively unit current sources in x, y and z direction to the source location and measure the potentials in each point. So this is a standard answer for during this lecture. And he found that the lead, the lead vectors on the level 6 are like these and they form the image surface part of here like this. And then he found on each 12 levels how the lead uh, vectors look like and this forms the image surface seen in frontal plane. When finding where are located in his model the hands on level 3, A and I and left leg on level 12 here in the center Joining those points, you get the Frank triangle. It is just that Frank triangle. That is how the image surface looks in sagittal plane, looking from left, and this is in the transverse plane. So the fundamental idea of the image surface concept is that uh, the lines joining the source and the measurement points or the lines joining the two measurement points are lead vectors only on a spherical surface in an infinite homogeneous volume conductor or on the surface of the spherical homogeneous volume conductor with the source in the center. So that just drawing those lines is true only in that case. If the volume conductor has different outer surface especially having also inhomogeneities, then they are not the lines joining the measurement points. Potential of current dipole in an infinite homogeneous volume conductor, the equations are just the potential equations. And on the surface with radius r, the potential is proportional to p dot r, so the r is a lead vector. Potential of current dip dipole on a spherical homogeneous volume conductor and there it is the same distribution as on that surface in infinite homogeneous volume conductor but its magnitude is three times higher. Thus the lines joining the measurement points are lead vectors in a spherical homogeneous volume conductor with the source in the center. Potential of a current dipole on a surface of an inhomogeneous volume conductor. For finite inhomogeneous volume conductors, it is needed the image surface concept. In the image space, the lines joining the points corresponding measurement points are lead vectors. So they are the lines in the image space uh, joining the measurement points, corresponding measurement points, are the lead vectors, not in the real space. That was the image surface. I go to the next concept which is straightforward extension and that is of the two previous ones this is a lead field. It was formulated and, and uh, defined by Richard McPhee and Franklin D. Johnston in 1953. The publications are given there. Three publications. In the image surface concept 
we fixed the source point and defined the lead vectors for all measurement points. In the lead field concept, we fix the measurement points and find the lead vectors for all source points. Same issue, same procedure, but opposite. The lead field describes the lead vectors for all source points inside the volume conductor. This information makes it possible to find the measurement sensitivity of the lead for volume sources. Before this, the source was point source. Now we discuss volume sources. That is important. What is the concept sensitivity distribution? Well, I come to this in detail, but I usually quickly show it first here also, because if I don't show it, someone may ask that what is the sensitivity distribution concept. Assume that we have in the volume conductor, we have a source in three different locations. We have a same single lead in all cases. The lead vector for this source location and that lead looks like that. In that case, it looks like that, and in that case, it looks like that. Therefore, the lead detects the source at different locations with a different sensitivity, because when we form the dot products of the source vector and the lead vector, the dot products are different, and the signal in the first case is small, second case it is larger, and third case it is still larger, so the sensitivity has certain distribution as a function of the location. This is called sensitivity distribution. I come again to this. I did show you on the first lecture. I go through that. Let us find what is the measurement sensitivity for a source in that location. How do we do it? We do it simply by calibration. We place a unit current source in X direction, measure the voltage and draw it here. We do it in Y direction and Z direction. And these three sensitivity vectors are components of the total sensitivity vector J sub L E, which we place to that location. Now, when we have arbitrary dipole here, the signal is dot product of those. This is what I have told you many times. Let us repeat this procedure for other locations in the volume conductor. We get lead vectors in this way. They form a field, field of lead vectors, which is called lead field. We do not need to find the lead vector for every, every infinite number of points. We find it somewhere and we can just interpolate to find its value in any point. Let us do another experiment. Let us feed a unit current to this lead. You find that it is distributed in something like this, which can be shown with current density vectors in certain locations, and it looks like this. Everything what I told you up to this point is very, very primitive. It is question of linearity and superposition. And as I told you before, now I tell you something which is better that you don't even try to understand, because you do not understand it. Just please believe it. This distribution of the measurement sensitivity, the lead vector field, the lead field is exactly the same as the distribution of this current density in the volume conductor of the same lead. That was told by or defined by our good friend Hermann Ludwig Ferdinand von Helmholtz and it is the principle of reciprocity. So please do not Try to understand it. Just please believe it. The field of lead vectors of this lead for different source locations 
he is called the lead field. Now, if we have a source in this point, we find the signal here by doing the dot product of the source vector and the corresponding lead vector. That is just what I have told several times. If we have several source elements here, we get the voltage due to each source element with the corresponding dot product with the source vector and that lead vector, that source vector and that lead vector. And the total signal here is sum of those signals and because of reciprocity the lead field is exactly the same as the current density field due to the current fed here which you do not have to understand. The current distribution can be illustrated in that way also. Then finally the equation in the previous slide it gets this form. The signal is the dot product of the lead vector and the source vector and because they both are continuous functions we take the integral. This is how we get the signal. I come in more detail to our good friend Hermann Ludwig Ferdinand von Helmholtz and his principle of reciprocity which he defined in 1853. He wrote the publication, you can easily read this because you are German, the uh, title is Über einige Gesetze der Verteilung elektrischer Ströme in körperlicher Leiten mit Anwendung auf die tierisch elektrischen Versuche, which I translate for other than German students uh, in this way, on the laws of the physical distribution of electric currents in volume conductors with application to animal electricity experiments. I have the publication here if someone is in interested in. I can donate it to anyone. So, here is something uh, which is flattering for us who are interested in bioelectric measurements. With application to animal electricity, Anwendung auf die tierisch elektrischen Versuche. So he, his application was bioelectric measurements, in, bio, in measuring in some uh, potential voltages from bioelectric phenomena in animals and humans. But the principle of reciprocity is a universal principle. It is just very flattering for us that he made the definition uh, with Tiris elektrische Versuche. Here is one historical uh, uh, trick, which I have to have to tell you first. Uh, at the time of Helmholtz, the measurement devices did not have any amplifiers. So what was measured was the current due to the electric activation of the heart, for instance. Current, it was an ampere meter. Current was flowing through the device. And the source was defined as a voltage source. Today, when we have uh, transistorized uh, uh, measurement devices from FET transistors, which have very, very high input impedance, it is the voltage what we measure and the source is considered to be a current source. So here is a dualistic trick that we speak about current source and voltage measurement and at the time of Hel Helmholtz it was discussed about voltage source and current measurements. The same issue but is it dualistically changed different way. Now I tell you what Helmholtz said to us. A galvanometer is connected on the surface of the body. There's a body and here is a galvanometer, so electric current measuring. Now every single element of a biological electromotive surface V sub D, that is a depolarizing the surface of the heart, for instance, produces such a current, I sub L, in the galvanometer circuit as would flow through that element itself 
if we take the electromotive force away and place it here to the galvanometer circuit. So this current I sub L equals to the current I sub R. That is what Helmholtz said. If one adds the effects of all the electromotive surface elements, the effect of each of which are found in the manner described, he will have the value of the total current through the galvanometer. This is the principle of superposition. So this is unusually clear text, clear translation. It was made by Frank Wilson. In, in, uh, it is found in the McPhee and Johnston the publication. So principle of reciprocity is valid for all linear systems, not only for these bioelectrical problems. This is just for historical reasons, uh, one picture of this publication of McPhee and Johnston, where they, they redefine the principle of reciprocity and, and, and uh, these principles. They say that uh, if we have the galvanometer here, and there is a car, uh, electric uh, source of the heart, then if E, if we take the, uh, this uh, electromotive force placed to the galvanometer wire, if it is equal to this voltage, then this current I through that region is equal to this current I. So this is just the same. That's what uh, McPhee and Johnston uh, described it. I said that principle of reciprocity is universal. You can take very many different kind of examples on that. I show you just one example. It was in, in Otaniemi in, in Helsinki University of Technology in, eight, in, in uh, not in 1853, but <laughs> there was a, a biomagnetism symposium in 1980, which I attended. You, you may find how I did look 35 years ago, if you, if you find me. There was taken a group photograph of these uh, 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 participants of the symposium. And the photographer was an experienced uh, photographer. And he said to, to us that, please take such a position that you can see the camera. Otherwise, the camera cannot see you. And then I found that, wow, this is the principle of reciprocity. So there are many different ways to, that, well, that, that's true, but that's a, a little bit of a joke. But there, you can define many different ways of principle of reciprocity, but that is, shows that it is universal. Helmholtz defined it quite complicated way, not necessarily complicated, but because the notation at that time was not the same as today. You can find from the book a modern uh, proof or the principle of reciprocity, a field theoretical proof, which was written by my friend Robert Plonzi. It is found there. I do not go through here. You can read it from the, from the book. It is quite a long story. But anyhow, it is a, a proof of the theories there. How does the electric lead look like if we think it in the way of principle of reciprocity? I show you. With electric lead, I mean that we measure the electrocardiogram, for instance. We measure from the, uh, the volume, uh, the, the, the voltage due to a volume source, and we make the measurement on the surface or inside the volume conductor with the electrodes. They do not necessarily need to be on the surface, but it is easier to think that they are on the surface. I emphasize the situation that they may be on the surface or inside the conductor by showing that this uh, uh, shaded region is the volume conductor somehow. In electric lead, we have two electrodes, this disk and that disk, and they are connected with conducting wires. And theoretically, definition is that the conductivity of this disk and this wire is infinite. And we measure the voltage between the disks. We find out first the distribution of the measurement sensitivity 
with the principle of reciprocity by feeding a unit current to the lead. So please note that this is theoretical way of thinking. You can do this somehow with the modeling uh, or with a computer, uh, physical model or with a computer model. Please do not feed a one ampere current to your patient. The patient will die immediately. So this is a way of thinking. We feed a unit current, one ampere or one microampere or whichever. The current distributes, uh, flows along the line and it raises several fields in the space. It raises uh, electric scalar potential, phi sub Le, which isopotential uh, surfaces are shown here. Negative gradient of the electric scalar potential is the electric field, which is shown electric field lines like this, E sub Le. The uh, volume conductor has a conductivity sigma and there is raised, will raise a current field J sub Le, which is sigma E, which has the same geometrical form as the electric field. This current field here is the lead field. You find in some other publications I return to this that it can be also defined that it is the scalar potential field but it is of course they are the same issued just to connect it together but I for certain reasons define that it is this electric current field. So the electric current field has such a value here if we have a source element here the signal what it generates to this lead is dot product of those two vectors and if we have a continuous distribution of source, volume source, the total voltage here is given with this equation. It is a dot product of this lead field and the source field, integral and 1 over sigma. That is the lead field and, and uh, principal reciprocity way to define the signal of the lead. What do we do with this lead field issue? We can find uh, or design uh, leads which have certain properties and the fundamental issue is to design a lead which detects the electric dipole moment of a volume source. That is a basic, basic problem. Let's find out a solution to this problem. How does it look like an ideal lead field for detecting the electric dipole moment of a volume source? Now the preconditions are that the source is the volume source. This is the first time now when we have a volume source, three-dimensional source. And the conductor is now simplified, it is infinite homogeneous. By definition, the flux source density is I sub F equals to minus nabla dot J I. The resulting dipole moment is by definition is integral R I sub F dV. This dipole moment has three components because R equals to X I plus Y J plus Z K. The three components are given here P equals to integral volume integral X i, i sub f dv, and so on and so on. Let's examine the x component. I omit several steps which you can find from the book. Finally, you find that the one component of the, this is the x component of the, of the dipole moment integral j i x dv. So you find that one component of the equivalent dipole moment is measured by measuring all its elements all around with the same sensitivity. So it is J i sub x which is measured and every location and they are just summed together in the volume. That is how the x component of the dipole moment is formed. And the similarly for y and z components. This means that the ideal lead field for detecting the electric dipole moment of the volume source 
has three components in each location in this volume conductor. It has the X component, Y component and Z component, meaning that in each location they are the X components of the source measured, summed together, Y components of the elements measured and summed together, and Z components measured and summed together. And all these are due with the same sensitivity. So this is the lead field for such a lead system which detects the electric dipole moment of volume source, shown with the lead field current density vectors. This is the same issue shown with the lead field current flow lines. So they are the same issue, different expressions. So you find that the in the lead field lead system which detects the electric dipole moment of the volume source are three components x, y and z and the lead field current is flowing linearly and homogeneously in the direction of the corresponding coordinate axis. If we design a lead system, sorry, if we design a lead system where when we feed a unit current to the x lead it generates that kind of current field in the volume source region, similarly in the y direction and z direction, that is a lead system which detects the electric dipole moment of the volume source. That is for the Eindhoven lead, but I may skip that. I show you how different issues change the lead fields. I show it for the electric case and you will find surprisingly how similar this procedure is for the magnetic measurement. Effect of electrode configuration and source size to the quality of dipolar lead fields. Preconditions are equivalent dipole moment of a small and large volume sources. We do simplify it by doing in the infinite homogeneous volume conductor and we have three cases, unipolar point electrode, bipolar point electrodes and bipolar large electrodes. So let us assume that we have a volume conductor here. We have three unipolar electrodes and the remote reference electrode. And we find, uh, this is for measuring uh, a source in the center. And we find how the lead fields look like. Let's observe only the Y component. You see that if we feed the reciprocal current to this Y lead, the lead field current flows radially like this if it is infinite homogeneous volume conductor. That is a measurement sensitivity distribution. Now we, if we have a small volume source which is rather far from this electrode, the lead field is rather homogeneous and linear in that region. But if we have a large source region, you find that the sensitivity Magnitude changes and its orientation changes throughout the volume conductor. The quality of the lead field is not good. This is for unipolar lead. Let us have a bipolar lead. For X we have uh, uh, these electrodes, for Y these electrodes and for Z these electrodes. The lead field for, we check first only the Y lead. The lead field looks like this. If you feed a reciprocal current, it distributes something like this in the volume conductor. For small source region, the lead field quality is very good. And for large source region, it is not so good. Let's take a third example. We have a bipolar leads, but not point electrodes. We have disk electrodes. The lead field looks something like this. It is very homogeneous in the center. Now if we have a small source region, excellent. If we have a large source, volume source region, quite excellent in that case also. So what did you learn from here? You learn that unipolar lead is acceptable only if the source is far away from the electrode and small. You get better result with the bipolar electrodes and the best result with 
uh, bipolar point electrodes, best result will be bipolar disk electrodes. And you will find that this holds for magnetic case as well. How to synthesize an ideal lead field? How to synthesize it? So now you know that a homogeneous linear lead field is what we want. How to do it? We have the volume conductor here, which is homogeneous. Please note that it is finite, but homogeneous. Let us extend the volume conductor with the same resistivity material as the volume conductor to a cylinder and we plate the ends with the conducting material. If we now feed electric current to these end plates, you easily understand that the electric current is flowing homogeneously and linearly in this volume conductor. Next step is that you may take the knife and cut these extensions down to the skin of the patient. Not further, but down to the skin of the patient. And because you don't cut the current flow line, the current distribution is, remains the same. The next step is that you may replace these extensions of the volume conductor with resistors. And you are very close to the ideal case. Very close. This principle is how, uh, uh, how the lead fields are designed in homogeneous models. And it, don't, it may have any form, this volume conductor, if it is only homogeneous. So I just summarize relationship between image surface and lead field. In image surface, in real space, we've defined the measurement uh, uh, locations uh, all around from the surface of the volume conductor. And in lead field, we found the locations for uh, source locations everywhere inside the volume conductor. In image surface, we found the lead vectors for every measurement point and their tips did form image uh, surface. And with that, we could find lead vectors which had desired properties. And in lead field, we placed the measured lead vectors to the source locations. And what I said is that due to the principle of reciprocity, these lead vectors are the same as uh, the current density vectors if we feed a unit current to the lead. I go to the Gaber-Nelson theorem next. It was uh, defined by Dennis Gaber and Clifford Nelson in 1954. Dennis Gabor has received a Nobel Prize, but not from this. He received it from holography. He was a Hungarian scientist. In Gabor Nelson theorem, the source is a moving equivalent dipole moment of a volume source, and conductor is finite and homogeneous. What means moving? Moving means that no, it don't necessarily need to move, but with this theory, you are able to find its location. You are able to find where it is located. It is required, <coughs> excuse me, it is required that the volume conductor is finite, it must have a surface, and it is required that it is homogeneous. The flux source density was defined, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to be minus nabla dot ji. Resulting dipole moment was by definition, I told this before, and it has three components, and it is examined its X component, and there are several steps which can be gone through and come to this result. When I was younger professor in the beginning of my career, I wanted to demonstrate my competence, and I always went through all the steps uh, in my lectures to my students, but now as an elderly Senior, I'm sure that uh, I have already demonstrated my competence, so I just refer to the book, please. Uh, when we do the summing 
for the similar equations for py and pz, we finally get that p is sigma times surface integral v ds. That's it. That's Gabor Nelson theorem. Very simple equation. What does it mean? Think that you are an uh, electrical engineer in the Charité Hospital in Berlin. Angela Merkel is taken to the hospital and she has some problems in the heart. And you are asked to do the excellent ECG. Please do it with the Gabor Nelson theorem to, to, to get the best result. What do you do? This is the equation how to get the ECG with the Gabor Nelson theorem. It is so simple an equation that it's a bit difficult to see what is going on there. So the electric dipole moment. First, there's sigma. What is that? That is the conductivity of the volume conductor. It is outside the integral because it is homogeneous volume conductor and it is constant. We do a surface integral, integral S, from measuring the voltage and times ds. What is ds? It is a vectorial, it, it, it's a uh, uh, surface vector. And how does it look like? That's like vectorial surface element looks like. <laughs> it is a vector pointing out from the surface of, and uh, normal to the surface. So <laughs> I tell you how Gabor Nelson theorem goes. We have the volume conductor. Inside it, we have a volume source and source elements, and its equivalent dipole moment is here with the yellow vector. You may easily understand that this source generates a potential distribution on the surface so that it is highest positive here, zero line transition is here, and highest negative there. Now I just demonstrate that, okay, we go on, I say to next, we divide the surface to surface elements, regions, areas, and provide each of those with a vector, which is the surface, vectorial surface element, Ts. Now this equation tells that it is measured made the, the, the product of this vectorial surface uh, vector element and the voltage. I take an example. What if we take a sum of only these vectorial vectors? They form a closed loop. That doesn't help in defining the uh, dipole moment. But if you first multiply each of these vectors with the corresponding voltage, you find that that's how they behave. D V1 is the high positive voltage time Ds1, and so on and so on, and that is negative, and so. So the total sum of those uh, V dot D S is this one, which according to the Gabor Nelson theorem is equivalent dipole moment or the volume source. That's how it works. I have given you several theoretical methods to analyze volume sources and volume conductors. It is certainly confusing different kind of preconditions and different. So I try to make kind of summary here. I agree that the summary can be done in different ways. This is one way to do it. Hopefully this somehow clarifies it. In forward problem, I did teach you the double layer method and uh, where it is valid, uh, sorry, uh, excuse me, the solid angle theorem method which used the double layer, sorry I, I just said it wrong. Uh, the source for the solid angle theorem may be the, is the double layer and the theory may be used in different kind of conductors, infinite and finite, homogeneous and 
inhomogeneous, but I discussed it only in infinite homogeneous volume conductor. So in forward problems, the, the solid angle theorem uses as source the double layer and as a conductor infinite homogeneous volume conductor. That these are the preconditions uh, for solid angle theorem. I did not discuss the miller gezelowitz model, so I skip this. In inverse problem, the sources and conductors for different methods are following. In lead vector and in image surface method, the source was a moment of a dipole in the fixed location and the conductor Mainly I discussed finite conductors, homogeneous or inhomogeneous, because it was more nice when having the surface, but the method holds, of course, with infinite conductors as well. Lead field method had as a source dipole moment of the double layer, moment of a dipole in the fixed location, dipole moment of a source, volume source, and also dipole moment of the multiple dipole holes, which I did not discuss, and moments of the multipole. And for conductor can be used any of these four possibilities. But this darker green region was that which I was mainly discussing. Gabor Nelson theorem has uh, uh, as a conductor finite homogeneous conductor because it need is, needs the surface and it must be homogeneous. And as the source may be dipole moment of the double layer, moment of a dipole in the fixed location, dipole moment of the source, volume source, and also it gives the location of the dipole, the moving dipole, which I did not discuss here. It is found from the book that with the theory it is possible to get five equations, three of those which are needed for finding the location of the source, and two other ones which can be used for checking the correction, uh, the, the, that the solution is correct. So hopefully this somehow summarizes what kind of sources and conductors in each theory were used and which are valid. I've several times visited Tallinn in Estonia in the old uh, uh, part of the city, there's a beautiful relief on the wall of, the, of one building. It is of the Estonian theater director, Voldemar Panza, the statue on the wall. And please look his hand, they are just like X, Y and Z components. So I'm sure if they are erecting a statue for me after I die, I will have my hand like this. <laughs> so I think this is just a good time for uh, ending this uh, lecture and next time we go to biomagnetism. Thank you very much. <laughs>